Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, the first chapter, beginning with the sixth verse. I invite you to take your Bible or the bulletin or whatever other device you might have with you this morning and read along with me. The first chapter of Acts, beginning with the sixth verse. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up, into, up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of God for you and for me. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Football season is finally here. <laughs> it's the most wonderful time. I love football season. Well, I love SEC football. And I'll go ahead and even out the playing field. I especially love Auburn football. <laughs> uh, but if you don't like football, and you are waiting for February to get here when it's pretty much over with, what are you going to do in the meantime? Another school year has begun. Parents rejoice everywhere. But if you are a student or perhaps a teacher who has already begun to count down the days to Thanksgiving or Christmas, what are you going to do in the meantime? S. Morgan Stern's character, Buttercup, from the Prince's Bride, knew a little bit about living in the meantime. Buttercup tries to hang on to the words of her true love, Wesley, I will always come back for you. But life leads her through seas of ill-infested waters and a fire swamp full of quicksand. Behind the scenes, unbeknownst to Buttercup, Wesley is fighting his way to her. And occasionally he makes an appearance and reminds her, I will always come back for you. Reassured at the sight of Wesley, it reinvigorates Buttercup to hang on and make it through the meantime. At last, that evil Prince Humperdinck succeeds in convincing her that Wesley has died, and it's only then that she agrees to marry him. But if you know the story, you know that Wesley shows up right at that last minute and through a series of events keeps his promise to her. He comes back for her. In classic fairy tale fashion, Buttercup found herself 
living in the meantime, that time between <coughs> once upon a time and happily ever after. Buttercup struggled during the meantime, sometimes forgetting that promise by Wesley, giving up hope. And it was only those occasional sightings that kept her going, those reminders that the one who loved her the most was coming back for her. In this passage of Scripture, we find the disciples beginning their time in the meantime. They have experienced all the wonders and the amazement, the love and the grace of Jesus' ministry. They have experienced the pain of crucifixion and the joy of resurrection. And during the days since the resurrection, they have experienced sightings and reminders of who Jesus was and what his promises were to them. And yet after all they've seen and heard and experienced, they ask the same question they've been asking since the beginning. Is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time when you're going to come back and you're going to take care of all those who oppressed us and we're going to be in charge? In other words, are we to the happily ever after part yet? And Jesus' answer comes in the form of promise and command. Along with his promise to return, Jesus restates their purpose. They will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and they will go into the world and be his witnesses. And so the disciples return to Jerusalem, to that upper room, they devote themselves to prayer. And they begin to look forward to that time when Christ will return. And they don't know how long that will be. They're hoping it's not long. And so there's this sense of anticipation and this waiting for this giving of the Holy Spirit so that they will be empowered to be Christ's witnesses. In the meantime, the disciples do what they've been taught. They live into their purpose and their passion. They continue to believe the words of the one who truly loves them. I will return for you. Rose Valland had planned on becoming an art teacher. Growing up in France, she had a passion for it. She was good at it. And after several art degrees, she was made volunteer assistant curator at a museum there in Paris. In 1941, Valen was put in paid service and became the overseer of the museum. This was at the time of the German occupation of France during World War II. Through the special staff for pictorial art, the Germans under Hitler began the systematic looting of artworks from other museums and from private collections. And they began to use Valens Museum as a central location to collect the art and record it and send it out to other persons and places in Germany. While the Nazis be, continued their plundering, Rose Valen secretly recorded as much as possible of the 20,000 objects that came through her museum. She also kept secret from the Germans that she understood German. And so for four years, as she kept track of all this artwork, to where and to whom it was going, she risked her life to provide information to the French resistant about those railroad shipments so that they would not blow up those shipments. 
Rose was living in the meantime. She didn't settle for sitting passively, waiting for the happily ever after to come. She did her part to bring about the heavily, happily ever after, doing what she knew to do, protect and save the artwork. You and I are living in the meantime. We, like the disciples, are still waiting for Christ to return. And while we long for that day, what are we doing in the meantime? Are we living like those first disciples? Do we carry that same attitude of anticipation that God is going to fill us with His Holy Spirit and that something is going to happen in us and through us? Do we long to be witnesses of this generation? Like Buttercup, we are to remember the words of our true love when he said he will come back for us. And although there are times when we grow discouraged and are tempted to lose hope, we survive on glimpses and experiences of God's mighty spirit and his love and his grace. What are we doing in the meantime? As present day disciples, we are called to live in the present and not be overly concerned about the things that are in God's hands Have you ever heard the phrase, they were so heavenly minded, they were no earthly good? We've got to be about the here and now. There is plenty of work to be done in building the kingdom. If you've been online this weekend, you saw where our fall uh, ministry and mission guide was published. Excellent ways in there for us to be involved in the meantime. Bringing God's kingdom here on earth. You and I are challenged to extend the work of the disciples in our time and in our place. and Carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. May we do so faithfully. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.